Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Butzel Long's webinar, Avoiding Mistakes in Running Retirement Plans. During this afternoon's presentation, please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the Zoom Q&A button. The presenters will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar, time permitting. A copy and recording of this presentation will be made available on the webinar event page on Butzel.com later this afternoon. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I want to thank everyone again for attending, and I'm pleased to introduce our presenters, Butts Along shareholders, Lynn McGuire and Tom Shevsky. Lynn? Good afternoon, everybody. I hope I won't uh, have any grumbling stomach during this. I'm glad you were able to join us all. Um, I'm a Butts Along employee benefit attorney. I've been with Butzel for over 13, almost 14 years now. And I work with employers of all different sizes and varieties on all different varieties of employee benefit matters. Um, my colleague, Tom Shevsky, is going to be presenting with me today. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Lynn. Like Lynn, I've uh, had the pleasure of practicing at Butso Long for over 14, almost 15 years. Uh, like Lynn, I engage in a wide variety of employee benefits work, retirement plans, executive compensation plans, welfare plans for employers of all sizes, large auto suppliers, um, smaller professional practice groups, and everything in between. So thank you all for spending your time with us today. So today's presentation was inspired by one of our fellow attorneys who for years has been complaining about problems that we see over and over again in uh, retirement plan administration. And he kind of compiled his master list of things that he'd like to see people really think about um, rather than repeating mistakes that other clients have made. And I can tell you many of these mistakes are things that on the front end seem very innocent, but they can end up being costly in many cases. And oftentimes we find that our clients really had no idea that there was a different way to handle the thing that they're doing they didn't know it was a mistake they could have avoided. So that's the point of today's um, seminar. We're gonna hopefully educate you on some things um, that you can avoid to save you some time and money. And in most cases, these clients were trying to save money. Hopefully this will help you. So we're gonna cover only a portion of the really bad and horrible things we've seen clients mistakenly do. We're gonna talk about um, conditions, terms in record keeping or third party administrative service agreements. We're gonna talk about um, bad or missing investment advisory agreements, uh, bad commitments that have been made in an investment policy statement, bad plan language regarding fiduciary duties, bad terms in trust agreements, instances where there's a bad uh, fiduciary charter, bad language, or there is none, where there's bad record keeping, especially with regard to participant loans and hardship distributions. Those are two chronic problem areas. We're going to talk about instances where um, nobody paid attention to options for regarding how participant paid fees are handled or allocated within the plan and people who didn't pay attention to the vendor level fees and how those are handled. So jumping in right at the beginning, um, We'd like to keep this as light as possible because it matter can tend to get a little uh, dense and difficult to stay focused on if it's not. So um, I'm not gonna read through the little jokes that we've inserted, little funny things, but they're just meant to give you a little break um, and reset the scene. So the first area is bad third-party administrative or record-keeping agreements. Now, basically every retirement plan has something along these lines. They may be under different titles, but they're all, um, they're all similar. And the biggest problem um, we see is that employers just forget or don't understand that these things are negotiable. It's not like your, um, your electric company where you sign on the bottom line and you get the services that you get. These things do have terms that can be negotiated. And it's important that you focus on those terms because they're always skewed in favor of the company that prepared the document. They never, just graciously decide to give you the benefit of a contract provision that's slanted uh, in one direction or another. So the first trap for the unwary is 
limitations on liability that you'll find in these vendors um, contracts. And usually these limitations of liability say that you agree that even if they make a mistake, you're not gonna hold them liable. Or in some cases, you will indemnify them from the harms that are caused by their error. And that can be, you know, it sounds like legalese and it sounds confusing and most people assume we're never gonna have an error that's gonna cause one of these problems that results in a fine or a correction, an expensive correction or litigation, but it happens all the time. We, we do corrections as a regular part of our work and they can get costly very quickly. If you have a provision in your agreement providing that they will be responsible for the mistakes they cause, you can be protected from those costs. Otherwise, you end up paying for the cost of your own attorneys plus the correction. Um, so this is something that you should negotiate. There, there, should not, there should always be some kind of a reciprocal provision. If they're not liable for your errors, you shouldn't be liable for their errors. Um, and this is something that, um, indemnification again, this is something where you're saying, I will pay for your costs that you incur when this error occurs. A hold harmless obligation just says, even though you caused this problem, we're not gonna pursue the money uh, to collect from you that would reimburse us for our costs in correcting this problem. Now, one thing to keep in mind there is if you agree to indemnify the third party administrator or record keeper, your liability insurance is not gonna cover that. That's usually your obligation. So basically you are self-insuring this liability to indemnify them. Another thing to focus on is uh, the ownership of records. Your plan records are things that, it's not just you giving this vendor information from your prior record keeper when they step in. It's records that they create. They receive information from many sources. And, and the issue is, are those your records or their records? And this can become very important very quickly, especially um, in light of recent guidance from the Department of Labor concerning cybersecurity and your obligations as a fiduciary with respect to records that are not even in your possess possession, but they're plan records. In the past, the Department of Labor has said specifically, those records are plan assets and you should negotiate contracts that specifically expressly um, cover those assets and ensure that they're protected. Now, in some cases that can mean you want a provision and they're saying that they agree to turn them over to you when the relationship is done. In some cases it can mean um, that they will agree to apply your standards of care in taking care of those assets, those records. And in the cybersecurity field now, that's exactly what it means. It means you want them to commit that they will comply with the highest cybersecurity standards in the area, in the industry, um, when they're holding information that is a plan record. Now, this isn't just records of your investments. This can include things like um, email addresses, the identity of people who are authorized signatories. Um, some third party administrators and record keepers um, keep documents for you um, that have key information on it that a cyber criminal could use to access your information or create false emails that look like they're coming from an authorized person uh, to induce people to do something that you shouldn't be doing. So essentially, you should be ensuring that your record keeping agreements uh, require them to maintain industry standards for record keeping and comply with the new Department of Labor cybersecurity guidance. Another provision that we see all the time is an arbitration provision that's too broad. Now, in general, arbitration saves people time and money, and so people are in favor of arbitration. The problem is that under ERISA, plan fiduciaries like you, if you're handling plan matters, you can get sued in federal court by any plan participant, by the Department of Labor, by a fellow plan fiduciary who doesn't like what you've done. And that means you're in federal court battling about something. And in most cases, you're gonna to wanna to point the finger at somebody else, like your record keeper, third party administrator, 
and say, we didn't do the, this wrong thing, they did. The problem will be if you're in federal court battling this litigation, but you've agreed to arbitrate the matter with your third party administrator or record keeper, there's a risk that you could be um, subject to different outcomes. The court might find that one party is responsible and the arbitration might find something completely different and that can leave you with no remedy. So it's very important that you negotiate the arbitration provisions so that they make sense under the circumstances uh, and they can be rejected under, if under the circumstances it doesn't make sense to use arbitration. Another provision that's very standard is that they will choose the jurisdiction where a lawsuit would have to be brought or where arbitration would have to be brought. And invariably, it's not in your home state. It means you would have to hire attorneys in a different state, or in some cases, it, they choose the choice of law of another state. And so even if you can manage to get the lawsuit in your state, your judge has to understand what another state's laws are and apply those. That can become very difficult and it's never to your advantage. Um, so before agreeing to a jurisdiction, venue or choice of law provision, you should understand what the implications of that are. Usually they pick that jurisdiction venue or choice of law because it's advantageous to them. The next topic we're going to talk about it are investment advisory agreements. Now, um, I, I often see investment advisory agreements that have been signed again, signed on the dotted line, and there's been no thought to negotiating the provisions we just talked about. All of those provisions we just talked about, all of the you know, jurisdiction, menu, record keeping, cybersecurity, all of those concerns apply to an investment advisory agreement as well. Now, plan fiduciaries really should um, retain an investment advisor if you don't have one to give you advice, at least on your investment lineup for your plan. Even if you have a 401k plan that is completely controlled by participants, if you are the one signing the paperwork from your record keeper saying, yes, I agree, this is the lineup of investments we're gonna offer participants, you are responsible for those choices. And if you're not an investment professional, you've made a mistake. You can be very much held responsible for making a bad investment decision. Um, and the inverse of that is that if you hired a professional investment advisor and they made the exact same decision but they did it based on their expertise, you would be uh, completely exonerated in most cases from carrying liability because you're allowed to rely on, a, on an expert as long as you prudently retained them and prudently monitored them. So you, if you understand and um, are in, assured through documentation that they followed a prudent process, you're off the hook. Um, so if you've got a bad investment advisor agreement, it doesn't get you off the hook there. And sometimes even worse, it can actually create liability for the plan fiduciaries. Again, like other vendors, they tend to put in language that protects them rather than you. Um, so these, these contracts should be negotiated. Um, in addition to all those things we talked about before, they've got their own special problems that need to be uh, addressed separately. Now, I mentioned that you, you should be monitoring your plan investment advisor in order to get the benefit of insulation from liability for the investment decisions that uh, recommendations they make uh, when you act based on those recommendations. You have to prudently select them and you have to prudently monitor them. So in order to prudently select a plan advisor, this might be counterintuitive. You can't just go out and find somebody who understands investments and who has a wealth of experience on advising individuals on investments. You need someone with specific experience in handling ERISA governed retirement plans, if that's what you have, or non ERISA governed plans, if that's what you have. So it's important that you're soliciting uh, a, a potential advisors for a review before you pick one um, from the right pool of individuals. You, you can't just uh, tap somebody who you know is an investment advisor um, socially to come in and give you a, a pitch to do this work. Investment advisors are fiduciaries to the plan. This is a, a statutory provision under ERISA. 
Um, and this is something that they're required to acknowledge in writing. So you need to see it either in the investment advisory or in a separate written agreement. And it should be clear that both parties understand that they need to comply with ERISA's requirements. So again, this is different than it is for individual advisors. They don't understand the ERISA rules and they may not offer your contract with that language in it. So another thing that you need to ask for in your investment advisor agreement is an obligation that they will provide or select appropriate benchmarks for each of your investments. And that when they provide their performance reporting, they give you this report saying how your investments did, that they compare them versus those appropriate benchmarks, as well as versus your peer retirement plans. And, and peer means similar, similar in size, similar in participant type um, experience, um, you know, education levels, that type of thing. So that you know whether you're falling behind versus the actual um, investments in this field um, and versus similar plans. It's easy to mask underperformance by choosing a benchmark that is not appropriate to your investments. And there will be times when you choose a benchmark or based on a recommendation from an advisor, you choose a benchmark or they do, um, that is perfectly normal sounding, but your investment doesn't fit in that category. So your manager skews things a little bit, you know, value or you know, growth, say they have their own choice of how they invest. If that makes the, the benchmark slightly off, there should be some specific commentary about why they've chosen that benchmark given that difference. Now I'm going to talk about investment policy statements. And this is something that um, normally a plan sponsor will be handed a proposed investment policy statement from their investment advisor. And so you've retained this investment professional, you're gonna rely on their advice or their services, but the investment policy statement tells them kind of the parameters within which your plan's gonna operate. Uh, typically, they'll hand you a document that details the respective roles and responsibilities of you, the plan administrator, versus them as the investment advisor. And sometimes they'll throw in other plan advisors as well and, and detail their roles and aspects that um, of their advice that they're gonna provide um, that can explain how the process will work. You know, as the investment advisor, they're going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is how they're gonna do it. This is what they're gonna measure themselves against and the process they will use to select investments. The risk is that if they get too detailed in there, if they've prescribed a process in that document, in that investment policy statement, and nobody follows it, even if it's for a perfectly good reason, a perfectly logical reason, you can be held responsible for having deviated from your investment policy statement, even though you haven't violated any law or regulation and you've done something rational in your view. Failure to follow the investment policy statement can create liability for you. And for that reason, we very commonly take out provisions that look perfectly natural and normal to everybody else. We take them out of the investment policy statement to prevent you from committing to something in writing that you may not in every instance be able to comply with. Another thing to watch for is the investment policy statement shouldn't require your investment advisor to follow their own proprietary review or ranking system. So they'll have their own you know, fancy little name for it and they'll ask you to sign off on this investment policy statement saying, yeah, that's how we want you to rank uh, and evaluate our investments when you make recommendations. The problem is that you're not likely an expert on that ranking or review system they won't let you into it to understand all of the details of how it will be applied, who will be applying it, when it will be applied. So unless you're an expert on all of those details, by giving your seal of approval through the investment policy statement saying, yes, go ahead and use that proprietary investment review or ranking system, you become the person who's liable for, for figuring out whether that was a prudent choice or not. Um, and since you're not an expert, you shouldn't be doing that. 
And the better path is to simply require them to use a reasonable and prudent process that meets industry standards. And if they're taking a position that their procedure, their proprietary system meets that criteria, that's their choice. And you're not the one that makes that decision generally. Another issue is um, when you have a participant directed individual account plan, especially, um, you have the option of choosing no fund fees or revenue sharing fees. It's important that your investment advisor and in the agreement, the investment advisor agrees to consider both and whether one or the other would be less expensive net of the revenue returned to the plan. Now re revenue sharing is something that's kind of behind the scenes. Um, I hope all of you are familiar with it. But the idea is that there are these classes of fees charged by investment fund, mutual funds generally, um, that they pay to the record keeper to pay them for the services that the record keeper provides to this investment fund. There, there's a bunch of behind the scenes record keeping documentation and disclosure information that they have to handle. So th they're entitled to a fee. The revenue sharing funds pay that fee. And then often that record keeper will agree to return a portion of those fees to the plan to pay for operating expenses. Sometimes the no fund fees, although they look cheaper on their face, can actually be um, more expensive than the revenue sharing funds. So it's important to ask your investment advisor to evaluate those criteria specifically. Now I'm gonna turn uh, the computer over to Tom Shevsky, and he is gonna uh, take up the baton here and talk about plan language. Thank you, Lynn. I'm just trying to access the slides now. There we go. Okay, so the plan document. Questions often arise. Can we do this with our plan? What does our plan say about this? Um, what happens in this situation? And the answer, or at least the first place to look for the answer is the plan document. The plan document contains a wealth of terms and provisions and potentially answers. So if you have a pre-approved plan document, the plan document is not just the adoption agreement. It certainly is the adoption agreement, but in addition to that, it's also the much lengthier basic plan document, which could be you know, 80 pages long, 100 pages long. It can be a very long document. Those two documents together, the adoption agreement and the plan document constitute what I'm referring to as the plan document. So that's that's the first place to go when any question arises. And the plan document should be referred to frequently. Um, it shouldn't be something that's just stored on a shelf or um, uh, filed away on an electronic filing system. So here is we know that it's, it's a fiduciary's duty under ERISA to administer the plan in accordance with its terms and failure to do so uh, causes a breach of fiduciary duty. So here we give a couple examples of, in essence, what is done in operation or administration might conflict with the plan document. If that happens, there is an error. The plan document is the key. That's the guide as to how a plan should be administered, how it should be operated. So it's very important if you use external vendors, uh, third-party administrator, record keeper, actuary, that they have a copy of the plan document and that they look at the plan document in the course of their servicing the plan. So a couple examples we'd like to point out is compensation. This is a key definition in any plan document. How is compensation defined? And unfortunately, I, this makes it more complex potentially, compensation can be defined different ways for different purposes in the plan document. It could be defined differently based on the nature of the contribution. So there may be one definition of compensation in the plan document. Uh, there may be several. It's very important to look to see how compensation is defined in the plan document. 
and to make sure that's consistent with the understanding if you use an external payroll provider, for example, of, of how the payroll provider uses compensation for employee elective deferrals to a section 401k plan, uh, for example. So I, I, again, this is an area where Lynn and I often see errors is the definition in the plan document of compensation does not match up with how uh, compensation is utilized in operation. The plan document contains, uh, should contain a claims review process. So if a participant says, well, I think I was entitled to a greater dollar amount or a greater benefit, or I was entitled to this feature or this option, uh, depending on the circumstances, it may be appropriate to utilize the formal claims review process that's, that's in the plan document and in the uh, summary plan description. So again, it's, it's, uh, sometimes people aren't even aware that the plan contains a claims review process. It's critical to, depending on the circumstances and how formalized the inquiry or complaint might be from the participant to utilize that process. Some people might think of that claims review process as rather burdensome administratively, but the beauty of it is, as we know it at the bottom of the screen, is that if you've complied with the entire process and a claimant still files suit in court, if the right language is in the plan document and you as fiduciary have followed all the procedures required for it, under the plan document, under the summary plan description, a court will defer to the decision of the claims fiduciary. So that's very important. And I've been involved in situations where that being the standard of review by a court has deferred a participant's attorney from filing suit in the first place. A retirement plan has to have a trust. There are certain um, minor exceptions, but generally speaking, there has to be a, a, a trust for a tax qualified retirement plan. So sometimes the trust language is in the plan document itself. Sometimes there's a separate trust agreement. A trustee can be an individual, uh, for example, an officer of the company, or it can be a financial institution. So if it's an individual at the company, oftentimes there's a financial institution that serves as custodian, and then there may be a custodial agreement. So one thing to, to make sure is, is the trust language in the plan document? I've seen situations where there is trust language in the plan document, but a financial institution is being retained as trustee and a financial institution has its own trust document, uh, similar to what Lynn was talking about earlier with service providers and vendors providing their own documents. And in this one particular situation, the trust agreement provided by the financial institution conflicted with trust provisions in the document. So we have to make sure that um, there's, there's not conflicting terms in different uh, uh, documents. Also, just again, uh, piggybacking on what Lynn was saying earlier, trust agreements provided by financial institutions uh, have to be looked at for provisions like limitations of liability of the trustee, indemnification, like Lynn was mentioning. There's often provisions in there providing that the employer or plan administrator has a very limited period of time to review trust statements. And if there's no objections made by the employer or plan administrator during that limited period of time, uh, then uh, you may forego the opportunity, you may have waived the opportunity to object or raise questions about what's in the, the trust document. Here, here we note that trust language should also be looked at to see whether the trustee or another party, another fiduciary has the responsibility to enforce employer contributions to the plan. So again, what I was talking about a moment ago is that trust agreements should be viewed as service provider agreements and reviewed the same way as Lynn was saying a moment ago. So fiduciary charters. As, as we note here, the plan sponsor is the name fiduciary unless the document specifies another 
party to serve as named fiduciary. Oftentimes, the employer is the plan administrator, but the document can specify that a committee is serving as the plan administrator or named fiduciary. So if it's a committee, there certainly should be a fiduciary charter. So what does this fiduciary charter say? Well, it should say things like how many members of the committee there will be. Could be a specific number, could be a range. Um, who are the members? Are they identified based on their positions or is it just they're appointed by uh, members of the board of directors of the plan sponsor? What constitutes a quorum? And nowadays, this is an important issue. Can they meet telephonically or via video or do meetings have to be in person? What's the scope of the charge of the committee? What plans uh, does it have responsibility for? What's, what's the scope of its responsibility? So these are some items that should be on a fiduciary charter. And similar to the plan document, like our discussion a few moments ago, the fiduciary charter should be frequently reviewed. It's not a document uh, that can just be filed away. It has to be adhered to. Um, the worst thing you can do is have a provision in a charter or in a plan document and not follow it. So here we talk about uh, the same issues as failing to follow the terms of the plan document if you fail, you, if you fail to follow the terms of the fiduciary charter. It's important also to have a fiduciary charter because sometimes uh, it, it may not be entirely clear if the employer or internal individuals working on behalf of the employer are acting as plan sponsor or as plan administrator. If they're acting as plan sponsor, as set lower, for example, uh, discussing a possible amendment to the plan document, that's not fiduciary in nature, but carrying out the operations of the plan is fiduciary. So a charter can help delineate in what capacity the employer is acting. That can be critical as to whether there's uh, fiduciary duties that attach to the action or potential fiduciary liability. So here we just provide more reasons and uh, things to watch out for in the absence of a fiduciary charter or if it's not complete or if there's failure to follow it. So let's talk a little bit about record keeping. Um, many plans nowadays use an external record keeper. Again, a record keeping contract, like Lynn was saying earlier, is a contract to be viewed for, for particularly for the items she mentioned, like indemnification, limitation of liability, um, I always like to say with the record keeper or frankly with any vendor, what's not included? Because many times employers think, oh, we don't have any responsibility for the plan or we've delegated all our responsibilities for X or Y to this external party. Well, in many cases that may not be entirely true. So vendors often list what they're responsible for. I always like to ask a question, what's not included? What are you not responsible for vendor? What do you expect us as plan sponsor or plan administrator to do? And again, many times this is delineated in the document, but it's a helpful conversation to have just for uh, operational purposes. So uh, minutes. Now, many times I find that an external record keeper or external investment advisor will take minutes of a fiduciary uh, committee meeting or um, any type of meeting uh, regarding the plan administrator. First of all, it's critical that anytime there is a decision or anytime there is a meeting to document the analysis the due diligence process that occurred, whether it's selecting a new vendor, whether it's monitoring an existing vendor, um, whether it's considering a, ch uh, considering a change in investments, whether it's addressing a claim of a participant. If you don't document the analysis that was done, it, it's very hard to prove that you did the analysis, that you engaged in the due diligence. So it's imperative to document what occurred through minutes. 
I often like to say about minutes, think about who the reader of the minutes will be in the future. Chances are it's not going to be a friendly party. It, it's more likely to be a Department of Labor representative, possibly an IRS agent, uh, maybe a participant uh, for, uh, excuse me, maybe a participant, maybe an attorney for a participant. Um, so, so bear in mind that a party looking at the meeting minutes in the future is probably not going to be, um, as they say, a, a friendly party. So bear that in mind when the minutes are taken. Um, again, if an external party is taking the minutes, I suggest that they be prepared in draft form for your final review as fiduciary. Oftentimes, or at times, there can be situations where an external party is not present for the entire meeting. Who takes minutes then where the assigned record, or assigned minute keeper is not present? Uh, also bear in mind if, an, if it's an external party uh, writing the minutes, they may write it in a way more favorable to them than perhaps you think it should be. So again, I always like to say, if you're having an external party record the minutes, do so and draft for your approval and then finalize those minutes and certainly make any changes you think are necessary. It, it, it may be, uh, I shouldn't say maybe, it will definitely be necessary uh, for certain policies and procedures to help implement provisions of the plan document and working with a record keeper to document those policies um, to the extent possible. So it's clear what, what action was taken and why. And you've also created a precedent now for future action. This can be helpful. So if a similar situation arises in the future, you know how to address it. Well, this is the way we've done it before. And of course, consistency can be very important. So a participant doesn't say, well, you gave so-and-so special treatment because they were a highly compensated employee. Why are you not treating me the same way as a non-highly compensated employee? So it's best for policies to be written, um, procedures to be documented in a non-discriminatory manner. And in the employee benefits world in general, when we talk about non-discrimination, we're generally talking about highly compensated employees versus not highly compensated employees, but certainly other aspects can enter into it as well. So it's best to always have a uniform process that's documented and that's um, consistently adhered to. This is an example of what I was talking about a moment earlier is what does the record keeper, external record keeper expect you to do? And so here are some examples the record keeper may expect you to keep track of, of hire dates, rehire dates, when someone's on leave of absence, um, a change in job positions, because that might affect eligibility to participate on the, under the plan. It could affect potentially uh, what category they're in for a, a matching contribution made by the employer or a profit sharing contribution by the employer. So there always has to be a continuous dialogue with the record keeper. So now let's talk about fees. So sometimes, uh, fortunately not as much as in years past, but sometimes companies tend to not focus on fees because they think, well, this isn't something being paid from corporate general assets, it's being paid from plan assets. And under ERISA, it's the opposite of analysis that should apply. It's much more important to focus on fees being paid from plan assets. When, when that is the situation there, an individual is acting as fiduciary. And that's uh, a, a critical task um, under ERISA. And this is an important um, hot topic issue, not only with Department of Labor, but there's been many uh, class action lawsuits filed by participants' attorneys regarding fees. Uh, even more so than Department of Labor in recent years. So it's very important to ask all service providers who are being paid from plan assets, and this should be certainly in the agreement with the service provider, what are their fees? There's many different types of fees here, as, as you'll see we talk about on this screen. 
the document should provide in specific detail the types of fees, when they apply, how they apply. Um, and I'll be honest, even uh, prior to joining But So Long, I worked as an in-house attorney for a financial institution. And in some of the uh, documentation and vendor agreements provided by the financial institution that I was asked to look at, there are all kinds of um, discussions about fees that could apply. And I had a hard time understanding uh, what these fees were and how they applied. And I said to the business people, can you provide me with examples? And in some situations they had challenges as well. So I always like to say, can you ask the vendor to provide examples of when these fees apply, how they apply, what are the dollar amounts, what are the percentages? Um, so this can be helpful in a number of ways. One is you have better understanding of, of comparing this vendor or this potential vendor if you're going through a request for a proposal process to other vendors by having concrete examples of how the fees apply, what are the amounts. But it also shows by documenting that you've asked and hopefully received some information that you've gone through a prudent, thorough due diligence process asking what the fees are. Now, sometimes you know, vendors just say, no, we, we can't modify our agreement regarding these fees. And, and then I'd like to say, well, okay, can you send me some hypothetical examples, even via email, um, how the different fees can apply? And at least there you can show you've, you've done some due diligence, even just asking, um, it's a step forward and showing you've done your due diligence and, and how these um, different fees apply. Some type of fees might be reasonable and ERISA requires that all fees be reasonable. And that's a determination that you as planned fiduciary have to make. Um, so fees at one point in time might be reasonable, perhaps when you first enter into the agreement with the vendor, but depending on how they're based, maybe they're based on plan assets, maybe they're based on the number of participants. As the number of participant increases, is the fee still reasonable? Um, if you have a, a, a record keeping fee that's based on uh, the level of plan assets and suddenly the level of plan assets has increased significantly because of favorable investment returns, is that fee still reasonable? Is the record keeper service and, and their corresponding costs and expenses really tied to the amount of plan assets or is it tied to the number of plan participants? So as there are organic changes in your plan over time, like I'm saying, um, different divisions are added or subtracted um, as, as um, eligible locations or participating employers come and go in the plan or dollar value of assets change or plan feature, features change. Maybe you had a loan provision, but now you don't anymore. So there's no longer um, assistance with uh, loan origination and loan maintenance that a service provider has to do. Reevaluate the fee structure over time, as I say, particularly if there's organic changes uh, with the plan. Uh, as we note here, some uh, uh, there's different types of fees, for example, uh, depending on the size of plan assets, uh, maybe an institutional shareholder type class uh, would be cheaper than retail. That certainly is an important consideration. It's the same investment, but what type of, of class are you in? What, what are the expenses? And again, it's, it's you know, many times the vendors just provide uh, extensive documentation, but it's hard to really understand it. That's where I think examples can really be helpful, or at least having a conversation, a working conversation, and document uh, what was discussed during that conversation. So here we talk about revenue sharing. Lynn was talking about that uh, in her presentation. Uh, if a vendor is willing to, to um, share, return some of its fees to the plan, what is the net cost to the plan? That's important, that's important to understand. Okay, well, um, we're at the end here. I've gone a, a, a little um, faster than I anticipated, um, but we're happy to answer uh, questions that any of you may have.
Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Tom. I want you to leave a slide up there, Tom, um, for the attendees. Um, if you're attending and you have a question, now is your opportunity. Uh, there's a button on the bottom of the Zoom to go ahead and click uh, to ask any questions. Uh, maybe while we're waiting, let me, let me sure. pose a, a hypothetical, um, something I encountered and um, I, I realized um, the media we're using right now, it, it may be difficult for people to respond, but I, I wanna throw out a situation uh, I encountered and why I thought it, it was it was troubling. So I attended a fiduciary meeting and it was an employer where there was a, it was a committee and there were many different divisions of this employer. And so each division had a different representative of the committee. This was a few years ago, so it was an in-person meeting. And uh, one, it, the meeting was taking place in Michigan, but one participant was in California, he didn't fly in for the meeting. The meeting began at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So he dialed in from his home, which was 5 a.m. After uh, a, a, maybe an hour or so of the meeting, it was turned out to be a three hour meeting. Um, he said, well, I have to go now. Um, I have to drive into work. That, that might sound like an innocent comment, but when you think about it, this really was part of his work. Being on a fiduciary committee is not an, an extracurricular activity to your job. It's not um, being on some committee uh, about uh, uh, an employee um, entertainment day or something like that. It's, it's not necessary. I don't mean to minimize that, but it's not just sort of a employee entertainment or something like that. So the question, I have to go now, I have to hang up, I have to drive into work. Obviously that person didn't consider being on this fiduciary committee as integral to his job function, to his duties. And certainly in the eyes of the Department of Labor under ERISA, being on this committee was more important than his normal day-to-day -day duties. So there really needs to be, and this is something we can help with education to people who serve on the committee of the importance of that position. It's not, as they say, just some, some mere side activity. In the eyes of the law, this is one of the most important activities you can do as part of your job. You have to take it seriously. Um, and frankly, as uh, potentially fiduciaries could have personal liability. So I always like to recommend to procure and make sure your company has procured fiduciary liability insurance. Now you might say, well, our company has errors and omissions liability insurance or directors and officers liability insurance. Many times in those types of policies, there's a, uh, there are exclusions for ERISA fiduciary liability insurance. So whether you're serving on a fiduciary committee or not, it's important that, that your company procure fiduciary liability insurance. And that's something uh, we can help you look at the policy to make sure uh, the scope of coverage uh, is complete. I've, I've seen policies where they only list one of the retirement plans, for example, and not all the retirement plans that the sponsor um, uh, oversees. So, you know, again, I just, I just hope that example kind of drives home the point that uh, sometimes uh, convincing your colleagues the importance of fiduciary action. Um, it's, not, it's not saving the company money. That's saving the company money is not supposed to enter into the equation. And that's something uh, we can help you if you need um, to persuade some of your colleagues. So I'm sorry, I, I spoke for quite a bit there. Hopefully there are some questions. Sure, actually, Tom, we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, First one, some housekeeping for everybody. Yes, a copy of the presentation along with a recording will be made available on bustle.com uh, later this afternoon. If you navigate back to this event page, uh, there'll be links there for you to download um, and to access a recording. Um, a substantive question came in here. Um, when an employee is terminated or terminates before they are fully vested, where do the funds go? That's a great question, Tom. Do you mind if I take that one? Sure. So 
Tom mentioned it's important to read the plan document. This is absolutely one of those cases. Under the law, there are a few different choices of what happens to that money. If somebody's not fully vested, uh, the non-vested portion will forfeit. Your plan document will tell you at what point in time the money is forfeited, meaning at what point in time it comes out of the participant's account. And it's also gonna tell you what happens to the money after it's taken out of that participant's account and moved into your forfeiture account. Typically, a plan sponsor has a choice of using that to um, offset plan expenses or to offset the employer's contributions. Um, there are some rare plans where the money is actually used to um, be shared amongst other participants, but that's generally not, the, uh, not permitted in most cases. So um, plan document is the, the Bible you have to go back to and read it. Thank you, Lynn. Any other questions? Well, maybe if I could just um, sure. extrapolate from, from that as well, that you know there are some employers where people leave and then they come back uh, a couple years later. And there are really intricate provisions regarding rehired employees. I've seen some employers that just treat rehires as if they're brand new employees, never had any previous service uh, with the employer. And many times that's, that's not correct. So there are provisions in the plan document discussing rehired employees. They, they can be very um, detailed and intricate at times in understanding. And we're certainly happy to help you uh, plow through the plan document and apply the rules and, and see what it says there. Um, Great. I think that looks like it's it for today. So thank you again, Lynn and Tom for presenting. Excellent job. Thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, just a reminder, um, if you have any follow-up questions after this presentation later today, this week, uh, please reach out to Tom or Lynn. Their contact information is up here on the screen. Uh, we'll be providing a copy of the slides as well as a recording on the website later this afternoon. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, thank you all. all.